This is Andrew Wolf. In this video I'm going to talk about the anemia of inflammation and there are sort of two subtypes of this. One is known as the anemia of chronic disease. And the other one is known as anemia of critical illness. Now, you know, most, actually most um, books that I've read sort of talk about these as two different entities, and I think that's primarily because the focus of these books is either um, the, with practitioners that are focused on chronic disease or critical illness. For instance, you know, obviously in the critical care literature you're going to see more information on critical illness, and then in, you know, sort of the gerontology, oncology, uh, primary care um, literature, you're going to see more information about the anemia of chronic disease. However, you know, I think these are um, similar enough to be sort of studied as one entity, at least for the purpose of this lecture, um, because they have a lot of pathophysiology in common, and there are some some differences, and I think they're relatively nuanced. So what we have here is, you know, some kind of initial insult that causes inflammation. And this could be infection, malignancy, um, an autoimmune disorder, um, burns, trauma, major surgery, etc. Could be lots, there's lots and lots of things, but you get the picture. This is um, a serious systemic illness that is causing systemic inflammation. Now, what happens is this inflammation starts a process that begins because of the release of cytokines. And the ones that are sort of implicated in this anemia of chronic disease are uh, IL 1 and IL 6. Um, and I believe tum tumor necrosis factor and interferon, one of the interferons. But, you know, there's a number of them involved. And it's really not important just to be aware that this is a process that is beginning because of inflammation and it's being mediated by cytokines. Now these cytokines have three effects. The first is on the bone marrow and it causes bone marrow suppression. Actually, it's really just bone marrow erythroid suppression. And this occurs because the cytokines um, make the bone marrow so that it is insensitive to EPO. Actually, I should draw like this. The bone marrow becomes insensitive to EPOIDIN. So it can't rev up those myeloid um, precursors to make red blood cells. Now the second thing that occurs is it causes erythrocytes, or red blood cells, to lice. Okay, and So we have autolysis of red blood cells here. Or apoptosis. Now the third thing that occurs, occurs in the spleen. So here we have our little spleen. And in the spleen, remember the spleen is uh, made up of uh, red pulp and white pulp, and in the red pulp we have um, the blood flowing from little arterioles to the veins through the red pulp, and the red pulp is filled with macrophages. And these macrophages engulf senescent red blood cells. And the cytokines here actually inspire these macrophages to take up and store fer um, iron in the form of ferritin.
So, and the, actually, you know, I, I talked about the spleen here, but this process is also incur, occurring in the liver. And it's actually being stored within macrophages in each of these organs. organs. Okay, so three things are occurring. We have insensitivity of bone marrow to epoietin, so we have less production. And we have increased destruction. And we have decreased iron availability. Now, you might be asking yourself, why does the body do this? Because it seems like it's destructive. Why would the body, in response to inflammation, um, cause anemia? Well, the theory is, and I think there's, you know, the theory is, is relatively sound. The theory is that, you know, in prior days, our biggest threat, you know, up until about 100 years ago, the biggest threat in our lives were little organisms called bacteria. Now, in order for bacteria to survive and thrive, the bacteria need lots of iron. So, you know, we need iron for oxygen carrying capacity. However, recognize that we have a lot of excess capacity. We don't need a hematocrit of 50% to survive. Those of you who have worked in the hospital for long enough know that patients do fine at much less than half this. In fact, you know, I've seen patients that are compensating just fine for at least a few days, way down near less than a quarter of a normal hematocrit. So we have a lot of reserve capacity. We don't need as high of a crit as we have, and our body is quite aware of that. But the bacteria desperately needs the iron to survive. So one of the ways that the body has adapted to um, preventing the growth of bacteria is by robbing the bacteria of blood. So we want to de decrease the amount of blood in our circulation and we do that by decreasing the number of red blood cells um, and we do it by decreasing the amount of circulating iron by storing it in a protective macrophage um, inside the spleen and the liver. Okay, so this whole thing seems to be an evolutionary strategy to prevent the growth of bacteria. Because remember, back a hundred years ago, if we had significant inflammation in our body, the most likely cause and our greatest threat was bacteria. So how do you diagnose this? Well, number one is you think about the history because the history, for those of you who have um, learned a little bit about diagnosis, um, the history leads you to your diagnosis about 90% of the time. So is the history consistent with chronic or acute inflammation? Um, number two, you want to do some laboratory studies. And what are you going to find in the laboratory studies? Well, first of all, you're going to find anemia with decreased red blood cells, right? And second, you may find either a normal or increased ferritin level. Now, the ferritin level is going to be increased for two reasons. One, because of increased storage in the macrophages. And number two, ferritin is what's known as one of the acute phase reactants. So when you have acute inflammation, ferritin along with C-reactor proteins and some of the other acute phase reactants um, are going to be elevated in the blood. So you're actually going to have an elevated ferritin or normal. Um, it's not going to be low because low would um, suggest that there is actually an iron deficiency in the body, but the body is not iron deficient in this case. Um, now the third thing that you will see is decreased serum iron and decreased transferrin saturation, which is the way that... So this serum iron is free iron. Transferrin saturation is a measurement of iron that is carried 
on the protein transferrin, which is the way most of the iron is transported in the bloodstream. Okay, so those are going to be the three main signs um, in, in laboratory analysis. Now you need to be very careful because I've seen a lot of people sort of make the assumption, okay, we've got a patient that's anemic and has decreased iron and, um, and transferrin saturation, therefore they must be iron deficient. And they completely miss the point that the ferritin is high, so the, the patient actually has plenty of iron stores, but the iron stores are just stored in such a fashion that the body cannot get to them because they are trying to prevent um, the the body is reacting by trying to prevent the high levels of iron in the bloodstream that might support bacterial growth. Okay, so please let me know if you have any questions about this. Um, I know it's a really, uh, my hold is all of my discussions of anemia is a very um, broad and complicated topic. So please let me know if you have any questions in the comments. I'd be glad to try to answer them for you. And also please take a moment to give me feedback with a thumbs up or a thumbs down and let me know if you like this video. Thank you very much.